the verse that's often quoted, 1 Corinthians 6, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. I submit to you that if you read that entire section of scripture, nobody in this room qualifies to be in the kingdom of God. You guys said that God speaks about the purpose of marriage and that it is between a man and a woman. Um, when someone either that has grown up in the church or just started going um, is gay, what is the church supposed to do? Are they, are they to like guide them to like convert them and like or suppress their attraction? And also, if the law of the land says that gay marriage is okay, and God says that we must follow earth's law to be able to follow the laws in heaven, what should we do? Civil disobedience is only justifiable if the government tells you to sin. In other words, it's telling you to do something God tells you you ought not do, or it tells you that you have to not do something the government tells you you can't do. Like, for example, if the government says you can't worship anymore, you don't obey the government. If the government says you have to have an abortion, you don't obey the government, okay? But you have to take the consequences of that. The government, the government may jail you for that or maybe even kill you. So those are the two reasons that we have civil disobedience. Uh, right now, um, there are things going on in this country whereby a photographer, for example, says, in my good conscience, I can't f photograph a same-sex wedding or I can't bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. And people are trying to force them to do so. Now, I thought this was all about love, but apparently it isn't. Why would you want someone at your wedding who didn't want to be there? I, it, do we have trouble finding photographers or florists or bakers who would participate in same-sex weddings? I don't think so. Why are some people trying to force other people against their conscience to do so? I don't think they ought to do that. And I think those people who, based on their conscience, can't get involved in those things ought to be left alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, for goodness sake, we allow people who have a conscientious objection to, a, to defending the country, we allow them to not defend the country based on that conscientious objection but we won't allow people who, won't, who can't participate in a same-sex wedding to exempt themselves from that? That seems crazy to me, but that's what's going on. Now, your other question about what the church should do with people who are same-sex attracted is love them and accept them into the congregation. The only type of person, according to the Apostle Paul, who is not accepted in the congregation is someone who claims to be a Christian yet claims that known sin isn't really sin. Because in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, expel the immoral brother. This man was having sex with his father's wife. And he said, expel that person from your congregation so that Satan can deal with them. Now, if you read 2 Corinthians, it seems that person came back due to that discipline. But everybody is welcome in the church. The only people who are not welcome in the church are those who claim to be Christians who claim that known sin isn't sin. Okay, then how do you handle that topic, though? They come to you, you know, they want guidance. The Bible says this. How do you handle that conversation with them? I was in Huntsville, Texas last week doing um, Sam Houston State University. And a young man came up to me afterwards and asked me basically the same sex question. Or the, and, and the same question you asked. And I said, why do you ask? He said, I think it's pretty obvious. I said, let's go to dinner. So at 10 p.m., he and I went out to dinner, and we sat there for two hours talking about this. This is not a soundbite answer. This is a conversation. But one of the things I said to him was, you have a very difficult situation because you're same-sex attracted, yet you believe Christianity's true. What do you do? And I referred him to a friend of mine who works with Robbie Zacharias International Ministries. His name is Sam Albury. Sam Albury, we've only met via email, but I know of him. He's the same sex attracted man who has decided that he is going to follow the scriptures and live a life of holiness. You see, the church ought to be trying to help people be holy. 
the church, the job, the job of the church isn't to turn somebody who has same-sex attraction into somebody who has heterosexual attraction. The job of the church is to teach everyone to live a holy life. We're all here to live holy lives. And I would just add on, if you go to uh, my website at freethinkingministries.com, one of the contributors, his name is Brady Cohn, and he's a guy that started a homosexual life in middle school all the way through high school and all, uh, on into college. And I believe it was a senior year that he said, I, I fell in love with Christ and I decided to love Jesus more than my own uh, desires. And so he's made some hard choices. They're not easy, but hard choices to leave that lifestyle. And he writes about it on a regular basis um, on my website. So I'd encourage you to start with some of his articles too. All right, thank you. Yeah. Great question. By the way, for Christians in here, the verse that's often quoted, 1 Corinthians 6, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God, homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. I submit to you that if you read that entire section of scripture, nobody in this room qualifies to be in the kingdom of God. Because we're covetous, that's one of the things in there. We're thieves, that's another one of the sins in there. We just tend to zero in on one of them, right? But Paul goes on to say, that is what some of you were, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified by the blood of Christ. Nobody's getting to heaven without Jesus.